So, uh, good morning. Um, I will try today to um, give you a window into how we think of high performance computing, how we utilize it at BP, and also uh, hopefully give you a sense, Jan, of uh, where we are going. So, what's the new normal, uh, our sense of it? Uh, let me start. So, how, um, how do I just move ahead? I hit the wrong button here. There we go. Got it. All right. So um, I have a few prepared remarks, but uh, they will be quite short. I think we'll spend a bit more time on discussion. Um, first of all, the picture on your left is our uh, first high-performance computer. It was a Cray back in 1976, more than 40 years ago. Uh, and on the right side, you have our uh, current high-performance computing facility, uh, which is actually in Houston, a few miles west of here. So 0.13 gigaflops to 9 petaflops. I would say both of them are awesome. This was very cool in its time, and today's high-performance computer is very cool today. Uh, we are very proud of these uh, investments over the years, 40 years of sustained investment. Um, and at BP, where we sit today, Jan, thank you for that opening. I think that put a good flavor on it um, in terms of where we are in the industry cycle. And just by way of uh, giving you a sense of my background, um, I'm actually a mathematician and physicist by training. And most of my career has been in and around technology, but also quite a bit of time in the business. <clears throat> so today I think of myself as a business person working in technology, connecting the two. Uh, and just like Keith said, we've worked hard to make technology really live and breathe in the business and be vibrant in the business. Um, there's a lot going on today also in the digital uh, transformation of our industry. And at BP we have declared uh, our intent to be the digital upstream company. Uh, we are investing into that vision. Uh, and the way we express that vision is by way of the connected upstream. Uh, and when I think of the connected upstream, it has three aspects to it. It has uh, the aspect of connecting people with data across the enterprise. Secondly, uh, a big part of the investment in the connected upstream has to do with connecting digital assets and physical assets. So most of our physical assets now have digital incarnations and we work on those digital assets in the office uh, before we do stuff in the field. Uh, and that's becoming increasingly more common, uh, much more simulation. And compute power obviously plays a big role in that. And the third part of it, which is I think going to be the true transformation of our industry, is where you start connecting machine intelligence and business decision making at scale across the enterprise. And that's starting to happen more and more. Um, I think it's, some people call it artificial intelligence, but I think it's bigger than that, much bigger than that. And I'll, I'll share some of that with you. Um, now, so HPC, high performance computing, is a core part of our connected upstream. We see this as a key enabler, a key enabler of our business strategy. And it's, it's also part of our ecosystem. It's part of our ecosystem in terms of connecting uh, people, machines, and data, and doing it for more and more different applications across the enterprise. So let me just expand this a bit further. So how do we think about this? It's, it's actually a continuous stream of innovation. You start with a business challenge. You think of a challenge that you can't solve with today's technology. You, you develop some clever simulations, clever algorithms. And then you uh, figure out that I don't have the space to run these. I don't have the opportunity to try out these algorithms. So you invest a bit more in compute power. That's the cycle. And out of that comes business impact. Well, that leads to new business challenges. And the cycle continues. And that's what the story is about, which takes us from 0.13 gigaflops to 9 petaflops today and growing. It's this continuous cycle of learning and improvement. And I think that's a hallmark of our industry. It's a hallmark of our people. Our people actually come to innovate. And they come to do things that have a real business impact from their work. 
So remember this cycle of challenge, smart and clever algorithms, utilizing equipment and state-of-the-art computing and having business impact, and then you learn. And, and, you, you, and the clock speed of this cycle is just going up and up and up. That's the other lesson here. We used to have new technology coming to the fore maybe every two, three years. Nowadays, the expectation is that there's going to be an innovation every month. Every month, you have to improve the business with something or the other. So I, I was at a conference recently uh, where there was a futurist, and he said that today is the slowest day in the rest of your life. Well, I don't think it's any truer anywhere than here in this world of high-performance computing. Wrong direction. So how many of you remember this phone on the left side? This, this, this predates to the time when we got going in the high-performance computing uh, business. Our journey is not that dissimilar. You know, what took from a brick-sized phone to what you have today and the amount of power that has been infused into that little package, our world is very similar. And, and you know, the, the big change in the telephone industry was the battery power. The amount of power you can actually squeeze into that small case is what gave it the, the movement. I think similar things happen in our industry. I actually remember 15 years ago, Keith, you may remember this, when we actually popped the power in the Westlake building because he was drawing too much electricity for his uh, supercomputer. And we were without power for a day till uh, Houston Light and Power came out and fixed it. Well, we took, we took care of that, but uh, that, that power itself is, uh, I think we've grown our power capacity usage by, what, 25 times in just the last few years. So um, this story is not that dissimilar. Keep going in the wrong direction here. But that just gives you a sense of the evolution of our supercomputing uh, inside an oil and gas company starting from 1976 to where we are. And what you see there is, you know, we don't do this ourselves. There are several partners in the room here who've been part of this journey with BP. And, and we thank you for being with us and for being, you know, innovative with us and, and driving uh, technology to where we can actually improve our business on the back of your innovations uh, combined with the integration that we bring. So this, this is truly a team effort here. Now, let me just tell you a little bit of a story about what we have done with this uh, supercomputer. So early 90s uh, is when uh, we started opening up the uh, deep water. And, and it started for BP in the Gulf of Mexico and then moved out to other parts of the world. And back then, the business problem was that we had these complex overburdens in our fields that we could not characterize. And we had, we had a bis big ask of our technology teams. We need to figure out what is distorting the image and do it quickly, please. So the team got to work. There was a clear business problem. And we needed a new direction a new, new direction in acquisition, technology for seismic, a new direction in, in how to process this newly acquired data. And this created some really exciting challenges for our technologists and scientists. And out of this came some uh, pretty chunky innovations that today are considered quite mainstream. How many of you have heard of uh, wide azimuth toad streamer, watts? That's quite mainstream now, but uh, that was a big innovation that we came up with, and it actually changed the paradigm of how data were acquired in the marine. Uh, ocean bottom nodes was another technology that was pioneered at the same time. And, and when you combine watts and ocean bottom nodes, and then the processing in our high performance computer, we were able to see salt and through salt a lot better. That led to uh, a series of discoveries in the Gulf of Mexico in the late 1990s and early 2000s. You know, discoveries like Mad Dog and Thunder Horse and Atlantis, which now are, you know, huge giant fields in BP's portfolio. Um, moving the story forward, 
uh, to the early 2000s. We started moving out into land and unconventional started becoming uh, more of a play. And BP moved out into places like Oman and Algeria. And land seismic needed the same breakthroughs that we had experienced in, uh, in the marine. And here again, uh, we needed some innovation. So our seismic heroes got to work and they came up with new acquisition techniques. They came up with uh, techniques that would allow us to collect a lot more data in much shorter time. And the whole idea here was I need higher density data, I need to address the signal to noise challenge, and I need to do, do it very, very rapidly. Just to give you a sense of some of the impact that these acquisition techniques have had, there's, have you heard of independent simultaneous sources, ISS? That was a technique that was pioneered by BP uh, in the 2000s. And we applied that in uh, North Africa and the Middle East, and that cut our survey time by 80%, 80%. That's a big gift to the business. If you're a business person and you are now investing about the same that you were investing before, but you're getting an 80% more, let's think of this as 80% more data you're getting a much richer data set for the investment that you're making. And it was a third of the cost of the seismic at the time. So big breakthrough, massive breakthrough, and it would not have been possible had we not seen the pathway to be able to do something with that data using our high performance computing capability. So we, we adapted that then to the onshore, offshore. Now ISS is again quite mainstream and we do it, uh, you apply it routinely in marine applications as well. A more recent um, business problem then, we started getting a bit more ambitious. So we got watts, we've got ocean bottom nodes, what's next? Well, we thought there was uh, more value in getting more out of the full waveform. So we started experimenting with techniques in our HPC around uh, modeling the impact of getting more uh, uh, out of the lower frequencies and the longer offsets that you can get out of marine data. And that led to uh, some exciting developments. We started, uh, we started seeing uh, better uh, resolution in salt. And by using some of the uh, novel technologies that we've deployed more recently, we've been able to uh, describe the salt to a much higher uh, resolution. In fact, one of the things one of our scientists said is, you know, he said, my mission in life is to make salt irrelevant. That'll be the day. If we can make salt irrelevant, think about how much more oil and gas you can de deliver at much lower cost. Because, you know, appraisal wells today in our industry are what actually uh, drive up the cost of deep water resources. And if we can reduce the number of appraisal wells we have to drill in order to delineate a discovery, that would be a massive game changer. So that's a challenge we've laid out for ourselves. Now, alongside this, I should point out, not all of these things that we have tried have yielded results. And I think there's a big lesson there. You have to stay with it. You've got to keep driving. You've got to accept failures. Um, I talked about the clock speed. The clock speed applies as much to success as it applies to failure. If you can fail quickly and move on to the next thing, that's good learning. That's learning that you should appreciate, and that's learning that we try and make use of. Um, you also get to a point where you say, you know, I need new hardware. I, I, cannot, I cannot do what I need to do with today's technology. And that's kind of where we found ourselves around 2010. We said we have all these ideas, we don't have the compute power. We don't have the ability to actually try out some of the things we want to try out in the lab. So that's when we invested in our current facility and upgraded uh, our computing facility to um, this purpose-built facility out in West Houston, 110,000 square feet of uh, space, 
Uh, when we opened this facility in 2013, uh, we had 2.2 uh, petaflops of compute capacity. Um, right now, Keith tells me we are at nine and growing. Uh, so this is, uh, this is where we are today. 30 petabytes of storage and it's, um, I'm told it's 18 times more powerful. I think it's actually a bit more than that uh, over the last decade. So this is actually a lab. BP supercomputer is a lab. And it's, it's a place where our scientists um, uh, come together. They explore ideas, they experiment, and they learn very rapidly. So this is not just a computer. It's actually, and that's why we invested in this kind of facility. We have collaboration spaces. We have the ability to actually pull people together. And it's, it's, quite, it's been quite a, a useful place for us. Um, some of you may know that the hurricane actually hit our facilities pretty hard uh, in, in August. Uh, this facility was built to withstand uh, events like that. It survived, and whereas our main office was affected, we were able to move people in here very quickly and keep <coughs> business going. So it, it actually delivered a side effect uh, benefit which has been a uh, business continuity. So that's, that's where we are today in terms of the facility. <clears throat> now I've talked a lot about seismic, but the supercomputing lab actually uh, has led to the opening up of a lot other avenue, a lot of other avenues for us in terms of uh, what else you can do with this capacity once you have it. Um, one of the early users of our high-performance computer was a new uh, research program we called uh, Digital Rocks, where you actually image uh, rocks at uh, micron scale using a micro CT scanner. And then you simulate the properties of that rock uh, through mathematical models. And that has actually become one of the mainstays of our uh, rock description program inside BP. We can simulate behavior, we can simulate the performance that the rock will deliver, uh, and more recently one of the innovations was one of the holy grails that we were pursuing uh, uh, through collaborations was a way to come up with uh, describing the behavior under flow, so the relative permeability of the rock. And we cracked that code last year. And now we are starting to do relative permeability calculations, which would not be possible without having access to this kind of capability. Um, and think of physical experiments. When you do a physical experiment of a core flood, specialist core, specialized core flood, you actually get one measurement. Here you can do hundreds of measurements through rock chips about this size. And you can have a much richer description of your reservoir in terms of how it will behave under flow, how it will behave under water flood. So your reservoir description and the performance prediction is that much enriched by having this kind of compute capacity. And of course, the clever algorithms that feed it. So that, that's an area that we have taken on board. The, we've also opened up the computing facility to our downstream businesses. And in the downstream businesses, we are doing a lot of uh, characterization of uh, computational fluid dynamics, um, which is uh, a field that has actually grown considerably in its application inside BP in the last few years. Uh, and uh, reservoir simulation, of course, is uh, one of the bread and butter technologies that we have applied, but it is no longer what we were doing a few years ago. We have extremely rapid simulators that can run thousands of configurations in a very short amount of time. And, you know, people today are talking about machine learning. Uh, we have been doing machine learning in our reservoir models, as you all know, for uh, decades. We didn't call it that, we didn't describe it in that manner, but that's what we were doing, which was a single command line and off you go and it, it runs and gives you a converged solution after running thousands of uh, simulations. Um, we've expanded this to include facilities now, so we are doing rapid facility uh, de field development planning 
And that is particularly useful in unconventionals where you have the ability to actually alter the sequence of your well, uh, well drilling program. And we've actually deployed this in Oman in our, our most recent field development for unconventionals, which is the largest uh, tight gas development in the Middle East. Um, and, and I think the opportunity to scale this capability across the different types of problems and business set challenges that we have is just unlimited. Seismic is still about 80% of what we do though. And um, as long as we have uh, smart seismic analysts and researchers, they'll keep dreaming up ways to crack the computer and demand more hardware investment, which is one of the things that lands on my desk almost every other month. So that's, that's an ongoing good problem to have. Let me, let me just close the circle on seismic. Uh, which is the primary user of our high performance computing capability. And it's actually a massive value driver for our business. Uh, this picture is a picture from one of our uh, Gulf of Mexico fields. And what you see is a sequence from top to bottom. Back in 2004, we described the salt as a very, very well described clean uh, body. And below that, we could of course see nothing. Um, then we had the innovations that I talked about, which is moving into uh, you know, full wave form, applying ocean bottom seismic and so on. And we got a slightly better definition and then you can see a little bit more of the field, uh, which is that picture on the top right that corresponds to the velocity model on the middle, in the middle on the left. But then um, one of our 20 something PhDs came to us and said, can I borrow your HPC for a couple of weeks? I've got, I've got an idea, I want to try it out. Uh, so we let, let, let them run their algorithm for two weeks. Keith opened it up, put everything else on hold. And lo and behold, out of that velocity model, we were able to create a much better image, which you see in that uh, green circle. What that did for us, it actually opened up a field within a field. And we have opened up uh, significant new resources within our Gulf of Mexico complex of assets by applying this technology. And of course, this is hopefully a stop in, in, in the you know, move to even better images in, in terms of making salt completely irrelevant. So that's where we are today. Now, where do we go from here? I'd like to just leave you with a couple of thoughts. First of all, we are hearing a lot of technologies coming into our industry from other industries. And of course, there's a lot of effort to make sense of different forms of data in terms of a lot of mashup going on and in terms of making things come together from different angles. So cognitive computing is clearly an area we are investigating. Um, artificial intelligence, of course, uh, machine learning, uh, also putting our toe into quantum to learn the potential there. I think that there's a lot of potential out there, but let me just uh, get close with a couple of things in terms of what I see us doing to push the frontier. First of all, I think as, a, as I pointed out, integration of technology in business is extremely important. You have to connect business, smart people, and clever technology to improve the business. And you have to start with the business challenge, back to our cycle. You have to start with a business challenge. It has to be challenging enough to where you need the energy and the enterprise. It has to be tractable, tractable enough to where if you crack it, you can see value in the business. So that's my job is to make sure we work on things that move the technical frontier, but also have impact in the business. The second part is commitment. You know, you showed this uh, fall off in, we did, not, we did not blink, I'm happy to say, through the cycles in high performance computing, in what we see as core technology to BP. Sure, there are things that we tend to kind of add in times of exuberance that go away, but the core aspect of what we do stays. And as a business leader, you know, I must commit to the long term. 
because a lot of these are long-term investments in people, long-term investments in technical capability, uh, yet I have to deliver in the short term. So balancing this long-term and short-term is extremely important. And that takes commitment, it takes understanding of the business, it takes understanding of the technology trajectory as well. And then lastly, you have to invest in new ideas, ideas that you don't quite believe in. If you don't invest in ideas you, you, you don't believe in, you will never get breakthroughs. Again, the trick I have to balance in my job is to make sure that I do it often enough but not too often. You have to fail a little bit, but you can't fail all the time. So that's the balance we have to strike. New ideas are extremely important. They're the lifeblood of our enterprise. And without new ideas, you go nowhere. You need that capability. You need that capability to convene people. And, and the high performance computing investment that we have made, and, and the, the reason we stand behind it, through thick and thin, is that it's where the ideation takes place. It's where experimentation takes place. And that's where we go into the future. So thank you for indulging me today, and I'm happy to take some questions. Questions? And afterwards behind you. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, this question is in regards to the innovation cycle. I'm wondering if there were any areas where it was more likely to identify progress in terms of identifying and addressing human biases. In, in regards to progress, I mean uh, things like identifying information in error terms and not disregarding them, or not disregarding out outliers. We found useful information in them, or uh, finding structure in error terms. I think that a couple of levels of uh, where I could address this. There's always inherent bias in uh, how we make decisions. And I think one way we address some of that is uh, through our collaborations. Collaborations are extremely important. Um, BP has a history of collaborating in multiple areas, and we try and bring multiple viewpoints into the analysis and you try and listen to people who have uh, different points of view. Because a lot of the times the biases are actually industry-wide biases. One area where we have seen biases creep in are in, uh, you may have heard of things like production optimization. Production optimization is a long-standing field in our industry. And uh, one of the things we decided to do a few years ago was to turn it on its head and say that production optimization is actually mm -hmm. about physics. It's also about data. And yes, you need to understand and you need to model the behavior of the reservoir, but you also need to understand what data is, is telling you and where you don't have uh, the physics explaining what's going on. You need to go back and adjust and uh, understand your biases. So what we did is we coded um, an algorithm where we actually do uh, something called virtual metering. So when you produce a well, you don't measure the production rate all the time. But what you do is we have a, a physics-based model that gives us a, a virtual flow measurement. And we stand behind it. But then we said to our technologists, now go back and when you test the well, go back and analyze each and every data point, and we gave them the tools to do it with. And out of that, you'd be surprised at how many times we were wrong. And through that, we created a workflow that actually goes back and calibrates that virtual flow meter at increasingly shorter time cycles. So it's about bring, bringing this awareness of what you don't know, you don't know very quickly to the fore. And I think compute capacity gives us that capability. And we, we are de deploying it in different areas. So we have, have a question over here. Yes. What do you believe the impact of the hyperscale cloud will be in your field? Um, we are in the cloud. So most of our 
data that we use for uh, non-high performance computing applications is actually in the cloud today. And I think it's going to have uh, a very significant impact on the industry. Uh, we are able to stand up applications much more rapidly now than we used to because we are in the cloud and we are moving everything to the cloud gradually. Um, specifically on high performance computing today, um, we like the idea of having a supercomputer on-prem. And the reason we like that is, is for the, for the uh, reasons I pointed out, which is the propinquity of people coming together, a place to convene, a place to actually learn and experiment. So I think there's a, there's a place for both. Oh. <laughs> that happened. All right. So I'll have, have a question here. That's a very nice talk. Uh, could you share more on the progress, the impact, and the future on the part you talk about the production optimization where you show the subsurface data with the reservoir simulation? Thank you. That's, that's one of the areas that we have invested quite heavily in. Uh, it's a cloud-based system that uh, provides all of our well stock is actually now in the cloud. And it's available to anybody in VP with the right access, obviously. But the idea there is that you are able to go and analyze your well data and reservoir data. We're trying to collapse this long term and short term. There's the short term cycle time, which is facilities optimization. And there's the long term, longer term cycle time, which is reservoir optimization. And we are trying to collapse the two together. Other questions? While you're thinking about your question, I have a question for you. Yesterday when I opened, I asked people to look left, right, behind them, in front of them. Mm -hmm. and, to, and for people to raise their hand if half the people next to them were the opposite sex. What are we doing with the workforce, both diversity as well as if you look at the average age in this room? How do we attach that, attack that problem and is that a, a big concern to you? It is, a, it is quite a concern. You know, we, we are very active in the STEM programs I mean, just looking around this room as well, um, the gender diversity is similar regardless of where you go in the STEM fields. It's not a US, UK, or anywhere else uh, phenomenon. And we have to work earlier and, and earlier in the uh, academic years to pull people into the STEM field. Um, and, and it's also, uh, so that's an area that we are quite actively involved in. BP has quite a few programs. Um, I'm very uh, happy to say that at least in the technology organization in BP, uh, our female representation is actually quite strong and growing. Uh, in BP and technology, we have about 30% uh, female, 70% male, which is actually a, quite an improvement over the last few years. And that is higher than the representation in the field. So we've been working this very hard. A lot more to do, Jan. A lot more to do. Other questions? Oh, we have one in the middle here. Could you perhaps touch upon some of the pitfalls of uh, digital transformation that everyone is now talking about? It seems like the buzzword. But I'm sure there are some pitfalls. Could you maybe touch upon some of them? A couple of things that we have learned along the way. Um, there's a saying that your eyes shouldn't be bigger than your stomach. So take on what you can actually deliver. And that goes back to connecting business with technology. I think we, we have a habit, and that's where you get a lot of people coming to you and trying to sell technology, which is great, by the way, good technology, but you have to connect it to a business need. We don't have technology going and looking for business solutions. We try and do it the other way. And this is through years of hard knocks. You start with a business problem and look for technology. Um, that said, I think you need to take on, take on some commitments. Uh, and the commitment BP took on was that we were going to start with data first. So we started pouring all of our data into a, a data lake. And we said, we will make it ubiquitous. We will make it available to people. And then we will gradually put the platforms on top of it. So that, that was one. And the second thing is data-driven decision making. 
it's not natural for people to do that. Um, a third thing uh, is also not natural in our industry, which is working and analyzing a problem to the nth degree. Um, I think the clock speed argues that you need to make decisions with this. So if you're, if you have, if you've got 70% of the information for a decision, I think it's too much. And if you've got 30%, it's too little. You have to be somewhere in the middle. But don't look for more than 70% of the data to be there before you make a decision. Otherwise, you're going too slow. Uh, for the, the production automation, uh, you know, now uh, a lot of uh, company uh, really focus on the UR especially for the thermal steam drive um, you know do you what do you think you know for like thermal f modeling the it's a very complex model you need to uh, solve the strong coupled three uh, system of equations uh, that's a conservation of mass conservation of uh, momentum and the conservation of uh, energy and also, if you want to consider the full scale, full uh, field optimization, the problem is very, very huge. We talk about with uh, CMG, they cannot, cannot sell the problem for us. So I wonder if we do like physical based model, we cannot do it now. We can try use the data driven, but data driven is not of uncertainty there. You can twist a lot of parameter, but give you the totally different results. Yeah. So I'm thinking probably the better way is combine the two together. But I don't know how we can efficiently combine these two approaches together to solve the full scale of uh, production optimization. Do you have any? Yeah. Any I think you've thinking? stated the business challenge, and you've come up with a solution. But the question is how. So we need some clever people in the room to describe it, but uh, that, that's exactly where we are going, is hybrid models. And uh, you have to just shorten the learning cycle. Um, a good example of that is interpolation. So there are techniques we use in seismic where we can interpolate, taking that to production optimization and reservoir modeling is another area. So there are different ways to address this, but I think it's a hybrid approach. Yes. Nice talk. Uh, could you give us some idea about uh, real-time processing, real-time analytics in BP? We are using uh, real-time. Uh, one, one of the areas where we have deployed real-time is uh, we've got fiber in some of our wells. And we are increasingly moving to a, a place where fiber is kind of in the basis of design of all of our well stock in the future. Today, we can actually take data out of a well in Azerbaijan, and it can be in Keith supercomputer in less than five minutes. And we are able to see sand coming in. We are able to see water coming into the well bore. We are able to sense gas coming into the well bore. And we are able to describe that in near real time. So that's here and now. Oh, we had one more here. Very nice talk. As you're working to try and align technology and the innovations in that with the business, what changes do you see happening in the business to align with you so that it's a synergistic exercise? Yeah. So first of all, I am the business as well. Um, the changes in business are uh, exactly what I said to the lady here, which is uh, being able to make decisions with less data and feeling confident enough in those decisions to be the appropriate decisions. Um, give you an example. We, we developed a field, it's called Atoll, in the Nile Delta in Egypt. We discovered that field in July of 2016. Typically, it would have taken five years to put that field on production. It's actually been on production for almost a year already. And the reason we did that is we went to our seismic experts and we said, give us the worst possible scenario. Give us the possible scenario which says these channels aren't 
connected up. Give us a scenario where the net to gross really goes down. And then on the basis of that, we made a decision for an early production scheme. So I think being close to the business is extremely important. And that's, that's what I push for, is that our technologists have to understand and speak business. If we can do that and the business can meet us halfway, I think we've got a winner. Question, thank you. Let's uh, join me in thanking our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. John, thank you very much. I think that was a perfect ending.